Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Disorganized right now. Sorry. Um, okay, so my name is still Anne Marie, and I am still an alcoholic, always will be. Um, Steps eight and nine. One of the things that for me, um, the first time I went through the steps, I mean, eight and nine just blew me out of the water. I had never taken responsibility for anything. I certainly had never gone to somebody and actually apologized, right? Um, In fact, actually, before I even did the steps, I had, um, when I had first met my sponsor at the time, my first sponsor, Cass, I had... Um, met her at a woman's big book workshop at somebody's house and um, I had asked her to sponsor me and she was not pleased about this request because she did not like young people in AA. I uh, came to find out that she didn't like young people in AA because her daughter happened to be a young person in AA. So, um, but uh, anyway, I asked her to be my sponsor and what happened was, was that she had said to me, are you willing to go to any length? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'm willing. She was like, think. I was like, okay. Yes, I'm willing. I had no idea what I just agreed to do, really. Um, but uh, so she said, fine, go home, get a big book, make sure it has no marks, and call me tomorrow. I said, okay. Well, tomorrow I had my sister's graduation from uh, graduate school in New York City. So I went to um, I went to the graduation, and while I was at the graduation, I um, afterwards we all went out to dinner in New York City. And while we were at dinner... I honestly don't remember how this transpired, but I do remember that my father and I got into an argument. And I do remember that I had said something to my father that ended the argument of, yeah, well, you just remember who had the extramarital affair, okay? And then he did something, and I pushed his arm, and then he pushed my arm, and that was the end of the argument. So I leave, and I go home. And all the way home, I'm talking to, like, Dave, and I'm like, you guess what my dad did, and can you believe this, and blah, 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 and he's just such a jerk, and I hate him, and um, he's always like this, and, you know, how could he ruin my sister's graduation like that? And I go home, and I was like, all right, now I have something I can call my new sponsor with, because now something happened, I have a problem, I can talk to her. So I call her, and I say, you're never going to guess what my dad did. And she was like, what? And I said, my father, I just went to my sister's graduation, and this happened, and then that happened, and then I said this, and he said that, and then I said this, and then can you believe he said this? And she was like, stop talking. Stop. Stop talking. I was like, what do you mean, stop talking? What? I'm not done yet. And she's like, yes, you are. Where is your big book? And this is when I was like, I don't know. She's like, well, find it. So I hung up, and I went downstairs, and Dave was there, and Steve were there, and we're all in AA for over two years at this point. And I was like, who has a big book? And, of course, all of us were like, what? What's a big book? I don't know what you're talking about. What does it look like? And um, we found one, like, I don't know, like near the chimney somewhere. Like, it was ridiculous, like, where we found it. And so I went running back upstairs, and she had me read out the resentment prayer, which is on page 67, which is, you know, though we did not like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick, too. We ask God to help show, to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we uh, would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God, save me from being angry. Thy will be done. Now, I read that out to her, and I had absolutely no idea what it said. And so she made me read it again, and I'm like, I still don't really know what it says. So then she says to me, she goes, it says that you're wrong. And that you're going to apologize to him, and you're not going to call me again until you do. And then she hung up. And I was like, okay. So the next day, my father came over, and I said to him, uh, Dad, it was very wrong for me to say what I said last night. It was disrespectful. I'm sorry. And I don't know if he was in a blackout or if he just didn't want to deal with it, but he's like, oh, whatever, sugar, everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. Like, let's not talk about it. Don't worry. We have any coffee. And I was like, yeah, sure. That was the extent of my very first amends. And the experience that I had was as it was, it was, it was as if God had like ripped open my chest and a drop of grace had come in. I got to experience for the first time what it was like to take responsibility and how it could change everything. And that I didn't need Him to make amends to me. 
that I could just make the amends and it just changed the relationship. And um, that was before I even went through the work. So by the time that I got to steps eight and nine, having gone through the work, when I sat down to make my amends cards, and when I say I made my amends cards, my sponsor had me write out, you know, these big cards that basically said, you know, I'm an alcoholic and um, I'm here to clean up the past with you. And here are the harms that I know that I've caused. And I would go through the harms that I caused with them. Now, this card, I would write out each of the harms that I had caused. And then at the bottom of the card, I would write out the three questions I was supposed to ask them. And it was, you know, are there any other harms that I may have caused that I do not know about? Do you need to tell me how any of these harms affected you? And how can I make this relationship right? Now, that last question, though, I thought, again, that I needed to participate in every relationship that wanted to participate with me. Okay? I don't. I don't have to. I have a choice, even when I make amends, whether or not I want this relationship to continue. So I can, if I do want to have this relationship continue, I ask them, how can I make this, is there anything I can do to make this relationship right? If I want nothing to do with them, like when I flew down to Louisiana, and he certainly wanted nothing to do with me, I say to him, is there any way I can make this right? And then he tells me how I can make it right, and that's what I have to do. And that's what I have to do in order to complete the amends. But once I've done that, the amends is complete. And um, so what happened was, is that one of the first amends that I made was to my brother. And my brother and I, um, he because he was eight years older, he was more like a father to me, and I was... I. I always very much looked up to him, but we had more of like a father-daughter relationship than really a brother-sister um, in some ways. And uh, with my drinking, I really, I did a lot of damage in that direction. Like I just, I, um, I had seen that I had definitely taken the spotlight away from him a number of times, that I really only called him when I needed something or wanted something, that I really was not engaging in the relationship with him to get to know him, but it was more out of obligation because you are my brother. And... I, I was engaging in this relationship with him out of obligation and fear as opposed to a genuine wanting to know who you are. And um, if you've ever been on the receiving end of that, that's actually very hurtful because no one ever sees you as you actually are. And to me, that's the biggest gift that I can give somebody today or that somebody can give me today is to see me exactly as I am and not judge me. And that's exactly to me what God's love is. So... Um, I went to my brother and, you know, the first few times I made amends, I had my card present. Okay. <laughs> I went in and I was like, here's my card. Okay, Dave, ready. <laughs> you know, and it was like, so I started with my family because they understood that. Um, and my brother understood. I sat down and I said to him, I was like, listen, these are the harms that I know I've caused. And I said to him, I know that I ruined your 21st birthday party. I know that I was really difficult during family holidays. I know that I... Um, I just always really made everything about me, and I know that I did not engage in this relationship to the degree that, you know, I could have. I could have been there in terms of helping you move. I could have been there more than I was. And he said, okay. And I said, is there, you know, any other harms that I may not know about? And he was like, yeah, you missed a few. I'm like, okay, what were they? And he was like, you know, that's actually how I found out. He was like, you never call me just to see how I am. He's like, whenever you call, it's because you want something. Now, he didn't know that the only reason whenever I called was because I wanted something was because I didn't think he wanted to hear from me because I thought he hated me that much because of my drinking. I don't need to explain it to him. There is no explanation involved here. We do not explain why we harmed you. We just listen at this point. And I said, okay. He said, um, you know, you, he said, every single occasion you always took the spotlight. He was like, it was so hard to try and be your brother. He's like, and I would try and impart, you know, some brotherly advice or guidance to you. He was like, and you would throw it in my face. And I said, okay, I'm sorry. I'm really very sorry. I had no intention of doing that. That was never my intent, and I'm really glad you told me that. So what I learned from that was that when he gives me advice, and says to me, you know, you should, have you considered doing this? I will say to him, no, I never thought of that. And I will listen to what he has to say. And in part, because I now have a respect for him, he has a respect for me where he'll say, do you want my opinion? 
And I'll usually say, you're my big brother. Of course I do. You know? And so then he'll give me his opinion. I don't need to argue with his opinion. His opinion is his opinion. It's based on his experience. And his experience is from God. So why do I have to argue his opinion? I just listen to it. And I either agree or I don't. And I started calling him just to say hi. Just to say hi. How's your day going? Randomly, I'll just, ran, just drop him a text be like, hey, thinking of you, love you. Um, and that's the type of stuff that has increased this relationship. Because when I asked him, how can I make this relationship right? That was the number one thing he said. He said, try calling once in a while when you don't want something. And I said, okay, I will do that. And I was grateful to have that instruction because obviously it does not come, relationships do not come naturally to me. You know, I do have to work at it. So that was one of my very first amends that I will never forget because it was really the one amends where, um, where they, he responded and he was like, oh no, no, you're not, you're not done yet. You know, it was like, he gave me extra information and I was really, really grateful to have it. Um, and it was, it ended up being a really positive experience. And so, um, after that, um, after my first time through the steps, my amends have been not, some of them have been less formal where it's like, you know, I'll remember something and I'll say to my mom, you know, oh, hey, by the way, you know how I crashed your car? And she's like, mm hmm. And I'm like, I never paid you back for that, did I? And she's like, oh, you don't have to. And I was like, well, you know, if I don't give you the money, I give AA the money. So it's up to you where you want it to go. But it's your money. It's not mine. And the one thing she said to me was she was like, well, when you get a job, you can pay me back. Because at that point I was in school. And I said, okay. You know, and that's a less formal, but I had already made a formal amends with my mother. You know, I always encourage my girls that, you know, the first time you go through the process, you sit down and you make formal amends. And then after that, if you end up having to make amends to the same type of people, it might be a little less formal, but it's the same type of spirit that you bring to it. And for me, the first time I went through it, my sponsor had me read, um, pages 104 to 108, which is the first four, uh, four pages of Two Wives. And um, I'm a big fan of the forgotten chapters. I think there are tons of living skills in there to help us practice these principles in all of our affairs. So I don't think that they're supposed to be forgotten. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, the Two Wives really could also be for, you know, those, those of us who... Um, might be nitpickers on words that, you know, we could just cross it out and say two relationships because it really gives a lot of skills on how to be in an intimate relationship with somebody, you know, um, and unfortunately we won't be able to get to that, but it gives a lot of skills on that. Um, but if you read the first four pages uh, where it starts with, as wise of Alcoholic Anonymous, we would like you to feel that we understand as Perhaps few can. We want to analyze mistakes we have made. If you go from there to the top of page 108, it literally put me in a place where I could go make amends and understand from that person's point of view what I was coming to do. Because that, for me, showed me and put me in a place where I was like, okay, that's what I did. That's the type of stuff that I did. And this is the type, you know, and this is what I'm going back to try and clean up. So that was really helpful to do. Um, when uh, I made financial amends, I made amends to everybody that was pretty much on my fourth step, and I made amends to people who even weren't on my fourth step. Um, and I know Dave has a lot of great stories about traveling the country to make amends, and I love them, so I'm going to give him most of the time at this point. But I did want to share that my most recent experience with steps uh, eight and nine has also opened my eyes up to a concept that I never had or encountered before, and that is a uh, concept of forgiveness. And it's not about me being forgiven. It's about me forgiving others. Because in step nine, what I had done the first few times, and as you go through and you realize you have to make amends, I was asking others to forgive me is really what I was doing. And I was asking them, how can I make this right? And what can I do to make this better? Or, you know, how can we relate better? And that concept just on its own, by the way, is a fabulous, I have found a fabulous relationship skill in general. Um, my best friend lives in North Carolina, one of my best friends, and she and I, 
you know, have been through a lot the last 15 years together. And there are times where it's like, it's just weird between us, or there might be things that are unsaid, or maybe one's changed and one hasn't, that we will come to each other and say, I don't know what's going on, but I need you to direct me on how we're going to get back on this page. You know, and that's kind of the same spirit you come to in step nine, because step nine says that we come to each other. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and those of the people about us. That's the purpose of step nine. Step nine is that we show up to be a maximum service to them. And we never know who we encounter or why we encounter them. But somehow we're going to end up being of service to them. And there are people that I have made amends to that I have turned around and helped where I made amends to this girl that I was very good friends with in uh, middle school and high school, Denise. And I finally found her, and I went to her house, and um, she lives, ironically, in Louisiana now. Um, and she was back at her home in New Jersey for the weekend, and so I came up and I made amends to her. And it was a perfect example of, you know, the resentments are either fancied or real, meaning they're either in your head or they actually happened. Um, this was a total in my head, and she's looking at me like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, the last time we saw each other, we got into a big fight. And do you remember that big fight? And, you know, you said this and I said this. And then I just totally shut you out of my life. And I completely abandoned the relationship. And that's one of the things that I do. That's one of my character defects or defenses. That's a defense of mine is that I, if something goes wrong between us, I just shut down and I'm out. You know, and uh, so I was, I, I made a menster for that. And she said, well, I'm just glad that you're back in my life. I don't remember the fight. If anything, I thought I said something wrong, she said, but I completely accept your amends. She goes, now I have a question. I said, what? And she said, my sister won't stop using drink. She goes, won't stop using cocaine and can't stop drinking. She lives in Las Vegas. And I said, okay. So we started talking. Her sister was coming home the following week. And uh, I said, she asked me, she's like, will you talk to her? She always loved you. Like, we hung out a lot in high school. And I said, absolutely, I'll talk to her. I'll bring some girls up. We'll talk to her. We'll get talking, whatever. She goes, awesome. She calls her sister that night. She tells her that she met back up with me. And her sister is actually really open to meeting me. Her sister's like, I would love to talk to her. Somebody could finally understand 100%. That was on, like, Tuesday. She was coming home on Saturday. Friday night, she overdosed and died. And Denise called me. I haven't spoken to Denise in like 15 years. Denise called me and she said, I need you here now. I said, I'm, I'm coming. So I went up there and I sat with her and I sat with her kids and I sat with her family. And so I went through the whole funeral and I went through the whole um, everything else with her. And it was, it was devastatingly hard. But because I was uniquely armed with the facts about myself and I had this experience that we all gain in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was able to be of service to her like nobody else could that day in that room. That was my job. And the whole purpose of me making, making, making amends to her right at that time, like God planned it obviously, obviously God planned it perfectly, but he totally planned it perfectly, um, where, you know, my real purpose was to fit myself to be a maximum service to God and those around us. So for whatever reason, I was able to make amends at that time so he could use me to catch Denise when that happened. And, um, and I'm grateful for that. And the recent experiences that I've had with respect to um, amends is also, you know, is not necessarily about being forgiven, but it's also about giving that forgiveness out. You know, it's like I, I will harbor, you know, like I had said before when we were talking about steps four and five, I can be like, you know, okay, acceptance. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems and still be like really irritated that my father is an active alcoholic and treats everybody like dirt sometimes, right? And I'll just be like, that's just him. That's just him, you know? Well, if I bring that through these steps, and specifically, there's a place in the step book on, in step eight where it talks about looking at the relationships where you feel harmed, where you've been harmed, and seeing how you reacted to that harm. Because even though I was harmed, I still have a reaction to that harm that harms back. Just because I get harmed doesn't give me a license to go out and stomp on you. I like to think it does. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Um... But, you know, I found that specifically with my father, that my response to him harming me was to shut him out 
And I justified it by being like, that's, he's, that's just him and I need to protect myself. Well, it was also a punishment to shut your father out of your life because he's sick and he can't help it. And yes, I have parameters with my father. I do not answer the phone after 6 o'clock at night when he calls because I know what's on the other end of that phone. And I also am not going to let him leave a third voicemail because the third voicemail is when I get chewed out for not calling him back. You know, so after the second voicemail, I'm like, oh, God, I got to call dad back, you know. But I don't need to punish him for being exactly who he is. I don't need to punish him for being sick with an illness that I, out of anybody else in this family, can understand. And his harm, that is how I react to his harming, is that I harm him back, shut him out, and punish him that way with silence. And it's not fair and it's not right. And so thank God for the step book because I learned that after the fact. I've learned that recently. And this past April, um, I just felt this really strong tug. I needed to go see my dad. And he had been asking me for a couple of years to come see him. And I hadn't gone to visit him in probably like three years at that point. Um, and it was just, you know, I was in a new job and I was getting divorced and I moved three times because I was getting divorced and it was just like blah, 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 like a whole bunch of me, me, me stuff going on, which legitimately I could not drop everything and go out to Colorado or Florida to see him. But now I'm in an apartment. My job seems pretty stable. The divorce is, you know, finalized. Like I can go see him. So, um, I, it was just kept coming up, kept coming up. And I said to my sponsor, I said, I need to go see my dad. I'm going to go while he's in Florida because it's closer in terms of the travel. And she said, okay. And you know, I said, I've never actually gone to see my dad since I was in high school. So at this point I realized I'd never gone to see my dad while I was sober by myself. And, um, my dad is, you know, drinks every night. And you never know what's coming. Like I told you guys last night, he can be the greatest, most hilarious, funniest, loving man in the world, or he could become a total violent tyrant. And he has a gun collection and likes to pull them out after a couple of martinis. So you never know what's coming. And, um, so I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to go, you know, people were like, you know, you should bring somebody with you, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, I just need to go by myself. I don't know why I need to do this, but I need to go by myself. And I told him, I said, I'm going to stay in a hotel. And I'm going to rent a car and we're going to have a great time. And of course, the day I'm coming down to see him, he was like, God, oh, you don't need to stay in a hotel. I'm going to give you my car. He's like rearranging everything. And I was like, dad, I am so excited to see you. Okay. You have two choices. You can pick me up at the airport and bring me to the rent a car company, or I'll just rent the car at the airport and I'll drive to your house. Well, but, but, but I'm like, dad, those are, those are your two options. Which you, which do you want to do? And he's like, well, all right, I'll get, I'll get you at the airport. I'm like, awesome. Thank you. I'll see you then. And then he was like, do you sure you want to stay at the hotel? We have enough room. And I was like, dad, I'm positive. I just need my own space. Just need my own space. And he was like, okay. I got down there. And what I realized was that for the first time, because I was being my honest, true self, I was being true to me by putting down the, I don't like the word boundaries, but by putting down what I could handle and what I couldn't, like, I'm not going to stay at the house and I want my own car in case I want to go to a meeting. Um, by basically putting that out there and arriving there truly with a heart full of love, which was totally God, not necessarily me. I saw my dad. And for the first time, I felt like my dad invited me into his home, into his life and into his heart. Because for the first time I stood there without judgment of him. And I never told him my judgments. But you know when you're standing there in silence and someone is judging you, we're not dumb. You know, but I stood there without judgment of him. And I watched him hold my stepmother's hand. They've been together for like 25 years. I've never seen them hold hands. Because when I get down there, my dad, like us, puts on a show. We call it Camp Dad. We're going to go do 15 activities today. You know? And... This time when I was down there, we went to watch a movie and then we came home and watched the news and he got drunk and then he showed me his gun. And instead of being angry at the gun, I was like, let me see that thing, you know? And I was like, oh, very cool. And he was like, give it back. And I was like, no way you're getting this thing back, you know? And I used humor, you know, and, and, um, and it was okay and it was comfortable. And then I left when it got to be enough and I went home back, I went back to the hotel and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful, beautiful experience because so the first time I realized that I had forgiven him 
and that my, by my withholding forgiveness, which who am I to withhold anything like that, right? Who am I to withhold forgiveness given the path that I've walked and the mistakes that I continue to make? But by me withholding that, I was keeping God out of my life. And I was putting that barrier up between me and other relationships that um, my alcoholism does, which is I can stand here, I can look at you, but I can't touch you. I can stand here, I can look at you, I can have a conversation with you, I can tell you I love you, you can look at me like you love me, but I don't feel it. And that was something that really hit, hit hard with me this time through the steps, and I'm very grateful to have had that new experience. So with that, I can't wait to hear about Dave traveling the country on step nine. I guess I'm telling a story about traveling the country on step nine. What if I don't do it? You're going to be a liar. Jeez, yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that uh, Amory I can reiterate. Um, well, first let me go back and uh, and read this. Uh, now we are more. Uh, now we need more action. Without which we found faith without works is dead. Let's uh, look at step nine, eight and nine. We have a list of all persons we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. Again, they're going back to this list. When I first heard about the steps, it was I, it was like this overwhelming task that I was going to have to do. Twelve different steps and all of this work and all of this writing and reading and doing all this stuff. And as you see in the directions that we've been talking about, it's really you know, one writing assignment and we keep going back to that same list. It can be as simple as we want. Okay, So we're going back to this list and we should have on this list the persons we've harmed and willing to make amends. Uh, we made it when we took our inventory. We subjected ourselves to drastic self-appraisal. Now we go out and our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. I like to look at it and explain it to my guys. This is not just me going out and, um, you know, apologizing to people or telling people, going back and, and, uh, and, you know, trying to say I'm sorry so that I clean up my side of the street. All right. It is somewhat cleaning up my side of the street, but I also look, think of it this way. It's like us going through life is like when you throw a pebble in the water. I'm going to get a little deep with you. Like throwing a pebble in the water. Okay. When I throw the pebble in, the ripples spread out and it affects the entire top layer of the pond. All right. That's the way we are going through life. Man, we are creating waves. <laughs> Everywhere we go, and those ripples go out and affect everyone around us, not just us. And think about it. If I disrupt their wave, their water, what does that do for their life and their people around them? Don't I disrupt their path? And don't I disrupt the paths of the people around them? So in a sense, what I feel like I'm doing when I'm making amends is not only am I trying to repair the wreckage that I've done, but I'm trying to help put them back on their original path as much as I can. I'm trying to help them. Think about it this way. Um, let's say, let's say uh, I stole a car, okay? And from that action, that person had their car taken from them. At that point, what do you think that's done to their life? Not only has it affected our relationship, but think about the trust that they have with everybody around them. Think about their own home feeling of security. Think about their own feeling of humanity. What do they think of other people? What does it change? How does it change their future goals and aspirations? How has it changed their dreams? How does it change their relationship with their higher power? Do I know? I don't know. But if I go back and address this and try to bring it to a place where they can understand where I was at and maybe address how it had happened, is it possible that I can try to repair some of that damage that I had done? Does that make sense? Okay. So, again, it's going back and trying to put the universe back to where I, I disturbed it. Makes it a little deeper. 
Okay. Thanks. Just appease me. Um, all right, so uh, we took in with subject of follows and repair the damage in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. So I'm running through like a bear. I am a bear in a china shop. I mean, a bull in a china shop. I don't go through gracefully anything. Okay, look at me. I don't tiptoe through anything. When I go through relationships, jobs, anything, it's very rough and it's very awkward and it, I, I make some damage. Okay, that's just me. Um, so you can imagine how, with my self-will, how that, how I went through life. You know, I, I, I just, I pushed people, I shoved, and I, I created a lot of damage. So running on self-will, I've got a lot of debris that I got to go clean up. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. Again, asking for that willpower, that power. If we don't feel we have it, then we ask for it. We don't sit around and go, oh, I really don't feel like it. I don't feel like doing it. Then ask for the willpower to do it. Remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any length for victory over alcohol. Any length, okay? Probably there'll still be some more misgivings as we look over the list of business acquaintances and friends we've hurt. We may uh, feel diffident about going to some of them on the spiritual basis. Let's be reassured to some people we need not and probably should not emphasize the spiritual feature on our first approach. you got to, again, go from the gut, feel like what, what, what the uh, purpose would be. Um, I brought, Amory was talking about these and I, I ran to the car and got these. These are, um, cards. These are eight step cards. Okay. Um, this is what I do. Again, let's not get caught up in the mechanics. Um, they don't talk about cards in the book. It's something that I learned. It picked up over time. It's something my sponsor showed to me. It helps me. It kind of helps me organize and it helps me to make each one, um, individual. Um, what we do with this is I have the name on here, the person. Uh, if I need to, I put contact information so that I have it on the card when I'm carrying it. Uh, contact information might be where they're at or a phone number. Um, I have the harm. Uh, on this one, I have several harms. Um, I try to put them all together. I don't make a card for each one. All right. Um, so I have several harms uh, on here. They do talk, I don't know if anybody's heard about it, but they talk about pluses and minuses. I don't believe in that. Um, I just make the card for the, the amends. Um, and then I, ha I write down the three questions. Um, I don't have them. Here's one that has the three questions on it. Uh, this says, um, is there anything uh, you need to tell me? Anything else you need to tell me? Is there, um, is there anything I left out? Um, and how can I uh, make make the, how can I make this right? That's kind of a shortened version of what Amory talked about. So I will I will carry this and I will take this with me if I want to. I don't go in with it. Like I don't go and sit down with the person and go and use this. Um, when I was started out, I did just because I didn't want to forget anything. But I don't do that anymore. Uh, I have a pretty good understanding of what I'm going to talk to them about. I also kind of leave it up. Um, to them. Um, Amory talked about the family ones. You know, interesting enough, with my family, it was a little more, um, I don't think my family was prepared for it for whatever reason. Again, my dad's in the program. I remember drunk, I yelled at him for never making amends to me. Um, and so when I finally approached him to make amends to him, he knew kind of what was going on. Uh, he took that time to make amends to me, and I it was okay, you know, uh, because of who he was and I, where I knew where he was stand, where he was coming from. I let him, I allowed him to do that, and we had this kind of exchange of amends, um, which was nice. And from that moment on, there was a huge amount of tension that was released from that. Uh, there was years of just rage and anger and, and um, Awkwardness. We, I went probably for about 15 years without saying more than hi, you know, passing them. Um, that's really just the relationship we had. But once we made that common bond and understood where each other was coming from, it was like the rooms. You know, we had it. We identified with each other. We understood who we were. So it was a lot of forgiveness that happened after that. 
Um, but I do believe my greatest amends to him was after he passed away was taking care of my mom. Um, because, uh, and that also was a, a great amends for my mom, but I do feel that it was a, a much bigger amends for him. He took care of her for the last, uh, year and a half, three years of his life. And when he passed away, somebody had to take care of her. So, um, it wasn't even a thought. I don't, I don't even think we debated it, talked about it. Um, I just kind of went home, got a bag and moved in. And, um, and that was a great period for myself and my, my mother and myself, um, for the last year and a half of her life. Only reason I was able to do it was, was because where I was at in my life, you know, um, for whatever reason, everything fell in place and I was able to be there for both of them in the end. Uh, and, and if I had not made amends to them, I, I cringe when I hear stories of people saying they didn't have a chance. You know, they, 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 they went through this process after the person died or they can't go back. And, you know, I'm grateful that I just had that opportunity, you know, um, for whatever it's worth. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so my family men's wasn't, uh, was a little, a little different. Um, with my sister, it's interesting. With my sister, I did uh, make a formal amends with her, um, and at this time she chooses not to communicate. Uh, so all amends don't go the way you, that you plan them. You know, that's, uh, that's her choice, and that's, that's okay. That's her path. I'm all right, I'm all right with it. Uh, maybe someday. I don't know. Um, but I'll always lay, stay, leave myself open. You know, if I, Facebook is really changed things too. You know, like I was non Facebook person up to maybe a year ago. I was like, I am absolutely never ever going on Facebook. And then I went on Facebook. And, um, I gotta tell you, it's interesting. And I was thinking about it when I was sitting there about the amends. I recently was able to make some amends. I recently got in touch with, um, people from high school. And, uh, I went to a reunion. And, um, you know, one of the things is those people didn't come up on a, on an inventory. I, you know, they were my friends and I didn't think about it. Uh, there was no resentment. I hadn't seen them in years. What I didn't know was, um, the things that they had felt or that they had perceived that I wasn't even aware of. And, and one of the biggest things that I had Anne Marie had talked about was, uh, um, a loss in friendship. I'd walked away. I had disappeared. And a lot of them did feel lost. They're like, man, you know, what happened? And so it wasn't, you know, I, I didn't, I don't want to say I made like this formal amends, but I realized that the harms that I'd made without even being aware of them. And now I was being opened up to a new, a whole new area where I, you had to work at relationships. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that, you know, you just thought you just hang out. Um, but I had to work at them. So now I'm being opened up to this whole idea of working at relationships um, and, you know, keeping in touch with these people. From this, um, uh, Karen and I, we just recently went to somebody's house to do, uh, to talk to the wife of an alcoholic. And and we'll get into that in step 12, but somebody, had a, a friend of mine had asked me, because I'm open with everybody, and you know, I'm, I'm probably a little too open, you know, like, Hey, where you been? I'm an alcoholic. You know, I've been sober 15 years. Uh, do a lot of speaking commitments. Yeah. I'm really active in AA, you know, and a lot of them are like, great. Uh, wow. Gotta go. You do. You get a lot of people just glaze over, man. They're like, wow. But another interesting thing is early in my amends, I made, uh, I made amends to guys in college and, um, I was, uh, you know, I was so full of myself in early sobriety, and I was doing that. I was like, "Yeah, where you been?" And I'm like, "I am sober now. I got three years, and and I'm doing great, and all this." And I was so into this. Look at me now. I was kind of little egos coming back. Look at me. Look how good I'm doing now. My mistakes were because I'm an alcoholic, and not because I'm a loser. Because I'm an alcoholic. I was trying to put put perspective into why I failed so much. And one of the guys pulls me aside. He's like, you know, I was depressed for a year. I couldn't work. We all got problems, man. You're right. 
I wasn't so special. Everybody's got life problems, and we got to deal with them. We deal with them in the wrong way sometimes. We deal with them in a different way sometimes. But we got to learn how to deal with them. Okay? It also taught me that I can do a lot of service in other, with other things than besides alcoholics. You know, I'm starting to do a lot more community service stuff. And I, my, I don't know why, but my, my, I'm being pulled in that direction. I, I enjoy it. You know, I'm meeting a lot more people that aren't alcoholics. I'm sorry. I'm cheating on you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm with normal people. You know, the normal homeless. <laughs> The normal, you know, the normal uh, uh, disabled. Um, but there's a lot of things that I can do because I believe in carrying this message. What One thing I learned about making amends is not only am I trying to clear up the rescues of my past, but I'm trying to carry a message. And that message is that there is a, a creator, there is a, a God, there is a, a, a power that is greater than all of us, and that um, that things can be accomplished that things can change, that things don't have to be the way they are. Um, and I can carry that to anybody. It doesn't have to be an alcoholic. Okay? By my actions. Somebody sees me in the community, how I carry myself, that is showing how I, that is showing the power and love of my creator. Love, compassion, honesty, all those things. That's what I'm trying to carry out. All right, so um, the last, uh, obviously, Amory left. She didn't want to hear the story of crossing country, but um, but I'll share it anyway. Um, it's an old story, uh, but it kind of encapsulates a lot of things about this immense process. Um, I was doing another inventory. I was doing a. Uh, it was it wasn't my first inventory. It was another inventory. I'd been in a relationships thing. You know, I was on edge. We were doing a work, we were doing a workshop up at the Wilson house and a friend of mine pulled me aside and said, what's wrong? And, you know, I, I think as soon as he said, what's wrong? I think I might have started crying. <laughs> I, like, it was one of those just meltdowns, like, oh my God. And he's like, dude, he's like, let's go through the work. And so we started on Friday night and I was doing amends by Sunday. Okay. So, you know, if you're, if there's anybody out there questioning how quickly can you do this? As quickly as you can, okay? So I'm making amends on Monday. So um, there was one thing that while we were talking about it that I realized that from my um, previous inventory that I hadn't made an amends for. And the reason was because I rationalized it, okay? Um, the amends was to, a, nun, uh, to a, a, a school run by nuns. And I really didn't want to make a, an amends to a nun. I mean, it's like making an amends to God's sister, you know, like... How do you do that? And so I didn't want to make a nun amends. I didn't really feel it was a big amends. And it was far to go. It was in New Mexico. You know, like, I don't want to drive all the way out there to make this amends. Um, so I kind of poo-pooed it. Like, it wasn't really serious. Um, and, uh, you know, so while we're going through this, he's, this guy, he's like, brother, you know, it wasn't Chris, by the way. This, this is kind of my Chris imitation, but it's somebody else. Um, brother, how free do you want to be? And so I'm like, oh, man. And at the time, I was in a lot of emotional pain, so I was like, all right. Um, I probably went a little overboard, but I went back to work, and that day I, I ended up taking um, two weeks off from work. Rented a car and drove to New Mexico. Now, the... Smart thing would have been to probably have plotted out a plan, taken a route, stopped at a few places, maybe seen a few more people. Um, but this drama queen said, okay, I'm driving straight. <laughs> I got in the car. I got a couple of six packs of soda, you know, some cigarettes, and I had three workshop uh, tapes. So each one was about 12 CDs, and I had three different workshops. And I got in the car and I started driving. I bought a big map too. Like with one highway going all the way across the United States. So uh, I got in the car and I started driving to New Mexico. And um, it took about hour 30. I'm pulling into uh, New Mexico. 
And I'd been up all, I'd been driving straight through, stopped for bathroom breaks. That was it. And, uh, I pull into New Mexico and I don't know how many of you have been to New Mexico, but it's beautiful. It's very spiritual. I love it. And, uh, so I'm pulling into the desert of New Mexico and the, and the sun is coming down the red, the, the, you see the red rocks and all the colors and the beautiful scenery. And I'm just, I'm a high as a kite. I'm like, this is, and this is spiritual. This is, this is God country, you know? And somewhere in between that and then getting to Santa Fe, which is hour 30, you know, it's 33 or so, um, I'm pulling into Santa Fe. Santa Fe's up on a mountain and the clouds start coming in. So I went from this is great to I'm going to die. Right. Within a few hours, I'm crashing fast. My, I'm getting tired. The clouds are coming in. It is it is about to pour. And I like it's going to rain. I'm going to fall, slide into a gully. I'm dead. I'm going to die. Why am I here? Why did I do this? Why? I should just go home. Why am I all the way out here? What the hell? And so fear is just overwhelming me. And I just really don't think I'm going to make it. And I, I guess for whatever reason, I needed to hit that. I needed to hit that point in my life. Maybe I didn't hit it before um, when I got on my knees at that rehab. Whatever reason, I needed to hit that point. So while I'm panicking, I look over at Santa Fe and there's a mountain. Matt, the Santa Fe's on a mountain. It's high elevation. And it was, it was, it was like, a, it was in a movie. It was like Moses, you know, with the tablets. All of a sudden the sky opened up and a beam of light comes down and is shining right on the top of the mountain. Beautiful, right? And I'm mesmerized by this thing. And I'm looking at that and I somehow get a little calm and I think to myself, you know, if that would shine, if that light was shining on me, then I might have some faith. I might be able to accept this whole God thing. And as soon as I'm thinking this in my head, across my shoulder into the back window comes a beam of light. And it's shining all over my back. And I'm getting chills and warm feeling all the way down my body and i i have complete calmness and i'm again back in that day with my dad in the sh in the towel and sitting on his lap i am safe and protected no longer have any fear and while i'm feeling all of this a car comes the other direction and as soon as the car comes in the other direction, the beam goes away. So now I've got a resentment. <laughs> I went from serene to resentment against the car. Okay, you bastard scared the light away. And then I look over at the mountain and I'm thinking, you know, that was great. But if you could do that one more time, I really would believe so, so now I am pumped. I am ready to meet the nun. I am ready to take on anything. I am driving up that mountain and I am, I have got so much power in me. There's nothing that I can't accomplish. And I drive up the mountain. I get to a hotel. I shower. I get in the car, rental car and I go over to the school. And now it's about six, seven o'clock at night at this point and it's dark. So I'm driving down these back roads, and uh, um, oh, by the way, I, I worked at a school while I was in New Mexico. I was a volunteer at a Native American school, and at the time, I was I, I was in charge of petty cash. So obviously, I don't have to tell you, petty cash and alcoholic, the, you know the end of the story. So I, I drive over to the school, and as I'm pulling down this dirt road and coming up to the school gates, the gates are there. They're closed. They have a chain on them, and they say, for sale. You gotta be kidding me. I drove 36 hours and this school is for sale. There's nobody there. The lights are out. The school was a hundred years old when I was there. And now it's closed. 
So the first, first rule is call before you make an amends. <laughs> All right? Like, don't drive. Call first, make an appointment, then go. The second, I call my sponsor, Chris, and I'm like, Chris, man, you won't believe this. Well, I'm actually yelling. You won't believe this. I'm standing here, and it's it's closed. It's dark, and what? It, and he's like, man, he goes, Chris is like, you're there for a reason, man. Find out what the reason is. And I'm like, all right. So now he sent a tired lunatic into the town of Santa Fe looking for a sign from God, okay? And I don't, what he doesn't know is there's a festival going on. So now you have thousands of people in the palace of the governors all crammed in, and I'm walking around looking for a sign from God. I am walking up to everybody. I'm look, people's faces are morphing as I'm looking at them. They look like a, somebody from high school, then it changes. I'm going over reading everything on the walls, seeing if there's a sign. I'm looking at everything. I am looking at everything like, like a burning bush is going to appear, right? Like the light beam wasn't enough. I gotta have more. So I get all the way across the palace of the governors and I haven't seen my sign and I am frustrated and I come up to, um, the chapel and it's Franciscan chapel. On the wall is the prayer of St. Francis. Now I knew a lot of guys that meditated with that prayer. So I start reading it. I start reading it out loud. As I'm reading it, I hear laughter. What is that? So I go around the corner, and standing there is three guys smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee. I walked up to them. I said, is there an AA meeting here? They said, yeah, you need one? I said, I guess so. They said, it starts in five minutes. I drove 36 hours to go to an AA meeting in Santa Fe, New Mexico. What freaks is freaky is it was five minutes, you know, that it was that close. But... I went in, I sat in the front row, and I told my entire story. And at the end of the story, I said, if anybody was sent by God, please see me at the end of the meeting. (laughs) And I had three people come up to me at the end of the meeting. Um, You know, the point that I got from the whole thing was it was the actions that I was willing to take. It took me full circle, but it was showing that if I was willing to do anything, how far am I willing to go to be free? And the reason I'm doing all of that is not so that I can, ha- you know, check it off a list, so that I can do one more thing, so that I can write it, you know, on an inventory, so that I can do the mechanics. The reason I'm doing it is so I get closer to my creator. I get closer with my higher power. And how closer can I get than a beam of freaking light? Okay? I was willing to go that far. I was willing to take those links, and I was willing to clean up the past. And when I asked, he appeared. I think we're going to take, I think we're going to ask a basket. Everybody's been waiting all weekend for the ask a basket segment. It's kind of awkward, Robert. Where's Anne Marie? She's hiding. Oh, it's to me directly. (laughs) Dave, I've heard people share they only have one spiritual experience as a result of these steps. I believe this is uh, deceiving. When people share that message, what do you believe? Hmm. You know, I guess it depends on what you consider a spiritual experience. And uh, one of the things, you know, just in sharing that story, I consider my kneeling on my, getting on my knees at rehab and saying a prayer and walking out without an obsession as a spiritual experience. You know, it was something that happened that was a dramatic change in my, my perception or my being as an alcoholic. So to me, that was a spiritual experience. I believe a beam of light in the heart of Santa Fe, New Mexico is a spiritual experience. So can I have two? I believe so. Uh, I believe there's probably many more things that happen that I don't even identify as a spiritual experience. Um, so for us, you know, all, all weekend, I think uh, I can speak for Am- I can speak for Amory and ourselves. What we've been trying to be clear on is this is um, is growth. 
This is being open and willing to grow on a spiritual uh, basis. Okay, so can we have multiple spiritual experiences? I think so. I think absolutely. Uh, what do you... Did you just read this out loud? No. Oh, okay. Okay. So what do you define as a spiritual experience? Okay. Oh. What do I define? Oh, man. Um, something that's not of me. Something that seems like a coincidence. Something that seems... Uh, seems like a coincidence. I was just standing outside with somebody and we were chatting and some guy pulls up out of nowhere and he's like, excuse me, is there an AA meeting here today? <laughs> and I was like, funny you should ask. Yes, actually, we're doing a whole workshop. We're on sets eight and nine right now. We're about to do the Ask It Basket and at six o'clock we're actually going to have a speaker meeting. He was like, really? And I was like, you should join us. That's, that's God. That's a spiritual experience right there. You know, it's, it's when I can see that something greater than myself is operating. Um, I guess that's the best. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> you got him an ask it basket. That's what got him in here. <laughs> he said, no way, you're doing an ask it basket? <laughs> well, great. Dave, what was your experience with the passage? With, with, experience with the passage. The wording was quite optional so long as expressed the idea without reservation. What's your third step prayer look like? What was your experience with the passage? So that passage, the wording was quite optional so long as... Oh, okay. Um, I honestly, uh, because I started doing the third step prayer early on, I memorized it. Um, actually, do you remember that? Amory. <laughs> Amory's such a nerd. Amory. Amory gave me two huge poster size prayers that I had in my room. I yeah, so she did them on actually white poster board mm -hmm. and had written them out and I had them posted on my wall. The third separate. Both the, the surf and the seven. Yeah. You know, again, it's quite optional. Um, I, I know a lot of my prayers is just, is really a, a conversation. I, I really like to have a conversation. It goes back to when I you know, identify with my grandfather being my guardian angel. I like to kind of talk it out. Um, you know, it's crazy. We were talking at lunch. Uh, I was talking to somebody. We were talking about, like, we have this idea of this all-encompassing universal being as a higher power. And then, you know, but then we're like, but i got to get on my knees and say the third step prayer exactly this way. You know, like, oh, come on. You know, I think, I think he's going to hear me no matter where I am. Yeah, whatever I'm saying, I think he gets the gist. Um, I think I got to be a little more uh, flexible with that and open-minded. Doing it is important. That's what I got to. I'm more concerned. Are you even attempting it, or are you trying to do it? You know, Commu I don't care how you're communicating. I don't want to know how detailed it is. Are you trying? If you're trying, that means that you believe. If you believe, then there's a chance that you have hope. If there's hope, then we can possibly get through this and have faith. But first, you gotta, you know, we gotta at least try. At least try. Just try once. That's it. Anne Marie, I was a little confused of your description of losing our choice to drink. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, or not. Sorry, I was back to it. Okay. Losing our choice to drink or not. Uh, do we not have, do we not have or make a choice when we make the decision in step three or to come into AA? Uh, no, we don't. It's my opinion from the book where it talks about it and there is a solution. Nope, it's in more about alcoholism. It's very clear. It tells us that we lost our choice in drink. It tells us that the baffling feature of power, uh, the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it, um, is this utter inability to leave it alone no matter how great the necessity or wish. And it's been my experience that, um, what has, what I've experienced in, um, AA is that, uh, this is probably better demonstrated if I read this part actually. <gasps> On page 30, first part about more about alcoholism. It says, we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. 
the delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. Just because God's grace makes me look like other people, just because God's grace enables me to act like normal people, just because God's grace has made me a functional member of society, does not mean that that alcoholism is not still inside of me. Just because I might look normal doesn't mean I am. And I think that's the best way that I can put it. Just because I haven't drank doesn't mean all of a sudden I gained this power that it specifically says in our book we've lost the power to choose whether to drink. I don't ever get that power back. But I do gain power to live a beautiful, prosperous life through God's grace. And that's the importance of working the steps to grow closer to God. That's the motive under the motive of working the steps because God, God saves me from drinking. And I think that's the best way that I can put it. And I'll just bring you back to, uh, where is it? Say it. If I had my book that was all marked up. <laughs> there's, I do. Thank you. <laughs> um... Sorry, it's in here. Oh, this is where it is. Okay, on page 24, it says, The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of, a suffer the, memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. And that defense has to come from a god. That defense comes from a higher power. And when it says we've lost the power of choice to drink, a lot of times we can fall for the delusion that we have this power of choice to drink just because now we have a God. It's still God. I still need to recognize that that's God. It's not me. It's not my power. Um, and the third step decision to me makes the de is the decision to let God in, is the decision that I want, I, I will live upon a spiritual basis of life so I'm not doomed to an alcoholic death. So whoever asked that, I hope I cleared it up. If I didn't, feel free to come ask me again and clarify your question. <laughs> wow, you're getting old. Yeah. <laughs> That's enough? <laughs> Did everybody hear that? She said, God, you're getting old. I just want that on record. You mentioned that there are no good or bad meetings. What about the meeting, uh, the new person in AA that does not get the opportunity to have the solution to, I don't know, because they only have been to, is it delusional? Sure. Discussion meetings. Ah, oh, thank you. They don't get the opportunity to hear the solution because they've only been to discussion. Okay. This is my feeling on it. Um, the concern I have is that uh, um, Emory and I went to, you know, our home group was a discussion meeting. Um, we, I was attracted to, and I think she probably the same thing. We were, I was attracted to something there. Something there was probably a love and compassion that I wasn't feeling anywhere else. Um, there was just, there was no misguided, there was no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There was no um, malice in any of these people. There was nobody out to harm anybody. They were really there just trying to stay sober. The way they were doing it, you know, wasn't exactly the way everybody was doing it, but it was doing it the way they, they picked up on. My dad got sober there. I got sober there. Um, a lot of people had participated and stayed there. I don't, you know, I internally had a drive to find more. If something was missing, when that time came, I found it. I sought it out and I found it. Okay? I believe because of my higher power, that's the guy, that's how I was guided. To believe it was because I was smarter, 
I don't want to go down that path. To believe that I was better than anybody there, I don't. I can't say that. I was no different from any of them. Um, I was no deserving more than any of them. I just had a different path at that point. Okay, so I can't judge how they're leading their lives. All I can do is try to be an example. I have to. I do believe that I have to leave them to to live the way they're going to live. Now the fear I have is so. So looking back at that, how can I say those meetings are bad if I survived in them for two years, two and a half years? Not survived. I was carried by those meetings for two and a half years. The other concern I have is I go to. I, I have a commitment as a detox. I've been doing it for maybe ten years, and when I go in there. I, all I care about is that they realize they have a first step problem and that they're gonna, they're, they're hopeless. Okay? And when they leave, I hope they make it to a meeting. I can't possibly sponsor all of them. I can't possibly uh, guide them all to where I think they should be. I also don't have a right to do that. All I can do is hope that they fall they go to an AA meeting. So my hope is that they don't hear there's bad meetings, good meetings, because that might prevent them from going to a meeting. I want them to know you're hopeless, you're in trouble, get to a meeting. And my hope is that with my work in AA, the love that I have for AA, that they are caught by an AA group and that they find their path, whatever that is. And that's not for me to make decide for them. That's not for me to dis determine for them. Um, I'm going to continue to do what I do. Uh, other groups are going to continue to do what they do. Uh, but I just I found too often, and I and I have a lot of new guys around me. I found too often they're getting caught up in this name game or this blaming thing and pointing fingers thing. I've had guys that have like 30 days telling me how the speaker sucked. And it was a workshop. So it was somebody like me with a lot of experience going, and they were judging them because he said he was arrogant and didn't shake his hand. Where did he pick that up from? You know, we are perpetuating that. I'm responsible for as much as everybody else. I perpetuated that in certain periods of my career. We had those dark tunnel meetings, you know, and there were, oh, those thumpers and... We were, we were separating ourselves and we didn't even know it. And I want to pull back. I want, I want somebody to be able to go into a group, say, I want this to be my home group because it's in my hometown. <laughs> Wouldn't that be novel? Not a half hour away. It's in my hometown. There's people from my hometown here. Okay. This is where I'm at. Oh, it sounds like that guy's got some 12 step experience. Oh, that's Joe. Joe's, yeah, he's got a lot of 12 experience. If you want to talk to him, go talk to him. Oh, but I don't think I'm really ready for the steps. Well, there's Jim, who's a sponsor, uh, does a lot of service. Maybe you'll be happier with him. Can't we all just get along in a meeting? Like, can't we just accept that we're all at different levels of spiritual growth and be okay with that? Do I really need to boost myself up by putting somebody else down? You guys know where I'm at as far as what it is with steps in the big book. That doesn't mean that I have to say that's the way, only way. And I know there's people that have a lot more experience that can probably look at me and say, you don't got no program. So I'm just trying to say, let you know, we've got to have a little more tolerance. The program's teaching is tolerance, compassion, non-judgment, love. Well, let's start today. Let's start showing that in the rooms, okay? I don't know how I got off on a tangent like that. You set me up, didn't you? That answer the question? I don't think so. Thank you. I like that the mine are in purple and yours are in blue. The ink. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so Anne-Marie, what was the most memorable experience or lesson you've had sponsoring a woman? Oh, man. I don't know. There's been so many. I really don't know. And I've learned so many from the women that I've sponsored. Um, I've learned so much about myself, and I've learned so much about humanity and about God. They really all have been such a huge, huge blessing. 
And every time I go through the work with them, I'm going through the work myself. Like I pick up a lot of stuff that I've never seen before, even though my book is marked up. Um, I, uh, I actually see a lot of stuff. That's how it got so marked up is because I keep seeing different stuff when I take other people through, you know, um, I really can't think of the most memorable experience. You know, there's a woman here that I used to sponsor, and I, I clearly remember a day where she was having problems in terms of taking a look at her first step, and we were walking up and down the boardwalk, and it was a beautiful experience. It was a beautiful day, and it was an incredible conversation. And I saw so much of what I needed to see and hear that day. And that same day, actually, there was a squirrel that came up on the porch and the squirrel came over and sat right next to my foot. And um, I believe in Native American spirituality. So I pulled out my little medicine card book and I opened up to squirrel and it was like signifying a big change coming. And I had just found out I was getting divorced. I was like, well, how you doing, little squirrel? <laughs> I was like, I guess we're having a big change, aren't we? And the girl that I was with was just getting sober. And I was like, looks like someone else is going through a big change. And like the squirrel came and just decided to have coffee with us. And um, we just hung out there. And, um, you know, another experience with uh, somebody that I sponsor who's also here is uh, actually, ironically, it had to do with squirrels again. Um, I was running before we were supposed to meet. And I almost stepped on what turned out to be a baby squirrel who had fallen out of the tree. And this baby squirrel was so cute. Like, I mean, it was smaller than the palm of my hand. It was adorable. And um, then there were two of them. And one had like a bloody nose because they fell out of the, they fell out of the tree and they couldn't get back up. And, um, and so I went back to the diner where I had started my run and I grabbed my sponsee and I said, we have to go save the squirrels. And I didn't know that this sponsee hates squirrels absolutely despises squirrels. And the sponsee looked at me like I was insane because I was like, get in the car. This person thought we were going on a 12-step call. I was like, get in the car. We have to go save something. And they were like, where, where are we going? And I was like, you'll see. So we get there, and there are two tiny squirrels, and I pick them up. and like, need your help. Get them back in the tree. And Santi was like, you want me to do what? But I learned later that this person told me, like, you know, that they saw a soft side of me that they had never seen before and that they got to experience um, – a different side of me and a different side of sobriety in terms of like what was important and what I noticed along the ride, like along the way that I was running. And we were just laughing about the fact that I pulled my car up next to a tree on someone's lawn to get this squirrel back up in a, you know, a nest. And it was hilarious and it was funny and it, it was about enjoying life and it was about being part of the greater good. And, um, so those are two experiences with two people that I had just in this room alone. And uh, I love sponsoring people. I love it. I find it to be such an incredible privilege because I get to learn so much about myself while you give me the honor of being on your journey. <laughs> Do either of you write in journals? No. <laughs> I can't even fake it. You? Um, occasionally. I... Uh, I don't like the stream of consciousness very much. Um, sometimes I will write in a journal to get out what's going on, and then I'll go back and take from it whatever's going on and try and bring it through the steps somehow. But um, I have found that for me and also in working with other people that um, sometimes journaling can just be an exercise of self-pity. And so that's where it gets dicey for me um, because, you know, I can just write and write and write and write and write about all these things. Because, of course, I'm only provoked to write when things are bad. Um, but uh, I do have a journal, and I do write in my journal every night in terms of the questions in the 11th step. And I will expand upon them as it does come. But in terms of, like, journaling, like, I sit down and, you know, I guess it's my sponsor refers to it as angel writing. That I do do sometimes, where it's like I'll, I'll put a question out to the universe, I'll put a question out to God, and then see what comes and write about it. But I don't sit down and, like, do an everyday journal necessarily. I'll do it either when something's going on or something's coming up or I'm so caught up that I just need to write to figure out where the resentment is to get back in there and take it out. Ooh, did you put yourself on your men's list? No. no. 
This is really easy. <laughs> this is easy for you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I did not put myself on my amends list either, but I did specifically when I was working the three-column inventory, I did um, write out resentments against myself. Um, and that was actually really, really helpful in terms of uh, coming to the balance between the self-praise and the self-loathing. But I did not actually put myself on my amends list, no. <laughs> Oh, for Anne Marie. Oh, that's an AK Sugar. <laughs> I thought the story of Dr. Paul D was about acceptance and adjusting expectations. When you mentioned that pages 417 through 420 cover life skills, that came as a complete revelation. I never heard of this. Could you please explain, expand upon this? Um, well, I mean, acceptance and adjusting expectations is part of the life skills. You know, so you're not wrong that Dr. Paul's story is about acceptance and adjusting expectations, but there are other things in the back of that, in the back of the book there that, um, do, 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 here it is. It is specifically on, oh, this is the third edition, I forgot. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Third. Oh, good. And it'll be where I know it is. Okay, so I'll just give you an example. The paragraph underneath the part of acceptance is the answer to all my problems. It says, Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage, all the men and women merely players. He forgot to mention that I was the chief critic. I was always able to see the flaw in every person and every situation, and I was always glad to point it out because I knew you wanted perfection just as I did. AA and acceptance has taught me that there's a bit of good in the worst of us and a bit of bad in the best of us, that we are all children of God, and we each have a right to be here. When I complain about me or about you, I'm complaining about God's handiwork. I am saying I know better than God. So from that little paragraph alone, I get the no more criticizing. I get the there's good in everybody, there's bad in everybody. Look for the good. I get the um, no more complaining because when I complain about you or I complain about me, I'm complaining about God's handiwork. And I get the no more playing God because I can't say that I know better than God. So there's four life skills right there you can pull out. But again, when I did... When I do this work, a lot of times I actually sit down with a sponsor and they, they help pull it out for me. So that's just an example of that one paragraph, how you can pull life skills out of that. That's it. Then we're going to break. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.